we are going to look at uh, microscopic organization of the respiratory system. So basically, this is histology class. And uh, we'll be just focusing on the histology. The understanding is that you already have a background on the gross anatomy of the respiratory system because I'm not going to focus on the gross anatomy. Yet it is very important for you to then understand the microscopic organization of the respiratory system. But just to take us off, when you look at the components of the respiratory system, we can view it from anatomical perspective and also from a functional perspective. Anatomically, we divide the components of the respiratory system into two. We have the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system, or commonly called the upper respiratory tree and the lower respiratory tree. The larynx is the junction between those two divisions of the respiratory system. So with the larynx being the junction, when you talk of the upper respiratory tree, we're referring to primarily the pharynx, that region, and the nasal cavity, that region. And when you talk of the lower respiratory tree, we actually start from the larynx downwards. So think of the larynx, trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and uh, the whole lung per se will be part of the lower respiratory tree. Functionally, we divide the components of the respiratory system based on the various roles that these components you mentioned actually do play. There are those ones which will be responsible for conducting air from the atmosphere all the way to the alveoli. They therefore constitute the conducting zone of the respiratory tree. Then there are those ones which are responsible for gas exchange. There are sites where gas exchange take place. They constitute the respiratory zone of the respiratory system. So I want you to have that better understanding of a functional division as well as the anatomical division. Remember, the respiratory zone is only found in the lower respiratory tree. The lower respiratory tree is the one with the respiratory functions. All right, having said so, I can now give you the objectives of this particular lecture. So remember it's histology. We are going to describe the structure organization of the wall of the conducting zone. So we'll talk about the structure organization of the conducting zone. While we are looking at the conducting zone, we're also going to name this different cell types which are present on the epithelium of the conducting zone. We call it respiratory epithelium. We are also going to look at the structural changes that occur in the conducting zone as you move from the nasal cavity all the way to the alveoli or to the bronchioles. What are the changes that take place histologically? After that, we are going to look at the structural components of the regions where gas exchange take place. We'll also look at the cell types that line the alveoli, and we are going to see the role of these cell types. We will, at that point, also differentiate between what is a thin and what is a thick blood air barrier. It's also called the respiratory membrane. And then we will look at the histological structure of the lung in general, and perhaps how do you identify a lung on a microscope? And lastly, from a theoretical perspective, we are going to outline the defense mechanisms of the respiratory system. Uh, these defense mechanisms are largely histological or rather immune defense mechanisms. So with that in mind, I would prefer to 
merge the first and the second agenda because they are interrelated. We mentioned that the conducting zone is responsible for conducting air from the atmosphere to the alveoli or from the alveoli to the atmosphere. In physiology, this would be called the anatomical dead space. The conducting zone constitute what you call the anatomical dead space. Now, the anatomical dead space is responsible for air conditioning. And when you talk of air conditioning, we are referring to the modifications that air undergo before it reaches the alveoli for gas exchange. So think about the air in the atmosphere and how it is moving all the way to the alveoli. What are some of the changes you want this air to undergo before it reaches the region for gas exchange? Could be it's very cold, you need to elevate the temperature to something that is good for the lungs or for the body. Maybe it's too dry, you need to moisten it. And perhaps it has a lot of dirt or uh, particles. Those ones need to be trapped, that is filtration. So basically, these are the modifications that air undergo as it passes through the anatomical dead space from the atmosphere all the way to the alveoli. So the conducting zone is responsible for air conditioning. So if you are to think about the part of the conducting zone from above down, once we start with the nasal cavity. So we are aware from gross anatomy that we have two nasal airways separated by a septum. Now, looking at it from a histological perspective, the septum, the nasal septum is both bony as well as cartilaginous. So that those parts which are bony and that those parts which are, which are cartilaginous. And from your gross anatomy, I believe you know which bones we are talking about and which region of the septum actually has cartilage. Each of the nasal chamber, either right nasal airway or the left nasal airway, each of them can be described to have three histological zones or three histological regions. This is what we call the nasal vestibule, which is the most anterior part of the nose. This is what we call the respiratory region, which refers to the inferior two thirds of the remainder and there's what we call the olfactory region, which is the upper one third of the remainder. So understand those zones very well. I want us to talk about each of the histological zones of the nasal cavity. So in this image, a coronal section through the nose, that's the nasal septum, and uh, this is the nasal airway. So that would be the palate, and this would be the roof of the nasal cavity. There are these projections on the lateral margin, on the lateral wall of the nose. We call them turbinates or uh, conchi. So the superior nasal concha is that one. The middle nasal concha and the inferior nasal concha or turbinate is that one. So depending on the level at which this cut has been made, you'll see the prominence of different concha. For example, this one is a most posterior cut and that is why the superior and the middle turbinates are more prominent and the inferior one is a bit less prominent. Usually the inferior one is the largest but uh, you need to see that from a more anterior cut than a posterior cut as we see here. The gaps between the turbinates remember they are called the nasometers, so inferior nasometers, middle nasometers and superior nasometers. And I believe from gross anatomy, you know what opens into each nasal meters. Okay, let's look at the nasal vestibule. So the nasal vestibule is the most anterior part of the nasal chamber. The nasal vestibule is just behind the nostrils. There's those two 
openings, the region just behind. That region is just lined by stratified squamous keratinous epithelium, just like skin. And it looks like this. So basically, the features of skin is what it actually has. We can look at it from a histological perspective and say that the nasal vestibule is just a continuation of the skin. It also contain hair follicles. And you know that the hair follicles in the nasal vestibule are a bit prominent compared to the ones you see in the surrounding. So there are a lot of hair projections in the nasal vestibule. We call them VPC. The aim of this hair is basically to trap particles. Remember the three functions of air conditioning, warming, filtration, and moisture. So this applies to the filtration. We also have sebaceous glands. Remember that where you have hair follicle, basically you have pilosebaceous units. So hair follicles and sebaceous glands usually coexist. Take home message, the histology of the nasal vestibule is similar to the histology of the skin with the prominent hair follicles. Then we have what we call the respiratory region of the nasal cavity. So the respiratory region of the nasal cavity is basically the lower two thirds of the rest of the nasal cavity. If you remove the nasal vestibule, the lower two thirds. So everything that's remaining, lower two thirds. That region is lined by respiratory mucosa. And uh, this image shows us how the respiratory epithelium looks like. So first of all, I want you to look at this and pick something. Remember, when you're classifying epithelium, there's some steps that is important to follow. And those steps will help you to grasp or to identify epithelial type. The first step is basically to determine that it's epithelium. And how do you know it's epithelium? Remember, we can see it's a layer of cells that covering a surface. We are also confirming that the cells are closely packed. And for me, those are very good identifiers for epithelial tissue. Don't start thinking of, oh, it is a vascular, it's resting on a basement membrane, yet you cannot see those ones here in this particular slide. Yes, it is true, those are characteristics of epithelium, but are they helping you in identifying this epithelium? The answer is no. Because basement membrane is best seen under electron microscopy, not light microscopy, and the vascularity is not something you can determine that easily, especially now that you're not able, even able to resolve the capillaries very well. So from a practical point of view, we can see that the cells are closely packed and that it's lying on the surface. So this is epithelium with, <clears throat> without any doubt. After determining epithelium, we want to know which type of epithelium is this one. So first we look at the number of layers of cells so that we're able to tell whether it is a simple one layer of cells, stratified multiple layers of cells, and pseudostratified, one layer of cells, but different heights appearing as multiple. So in this particular image, we see the nuclei of these cells in that row and perhaps in that row and maybe in that row. We can say that we are seeing roughly three to four nuclear layers. So basically it is not simple because in a simple epithelium, we'd expect to see only one nuclear layer roughly. So definitely the cells, it's not simple. However, look at the apical zone of the epithelium. It's relatively devoid of nuclei. We can forget about that one. 
so relatively lacking the nuclear. And that passes a very important message that we don't actually have cells hanging on the top, even though these nuclei are at different zones, all these cells are resting on the basement membrane, which is expected to be somewhere here at that level. All the cells rest on the basal lamina, all the cells touch the base, except that some cells are short like that one. So its nucleus will be very down and some cells are very tall like this one. And so its nucleus will be somewhere there, but all of them reach the base. So this epithelium is pseudostratified as opposed to being stratified. We can see multiple nuclear zones, but the nuclei are concentrated on the basal aspect. Having said so, the next thing is to determine the shape of the cells which are on the top. If you have a pseudostratified epithelium as a concept, you don't expect the tall ones to reach the top. And so pseudostratified epithelium can only qualify to be columnar. So it is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Next thing is to pick some things that we usually see in this particular epithelium. And uh, basically what we learn is that uh, when you classify epithelium, one based on the number of cell layers, which you said is pseudostratified, two based on the shape of the cells that reach the top, columnar, and three, the type of apical adaptation that we are seeing. And look at that one. So this is cilia basically. Therefore, we can say with confidence that the respiratory epithelium is pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. We can put a comma there at that particular point. That is basically what, what uh, respiratory epithelium is. So you start for the columnar ciliated epithelium. Now, specific for the respiratory epithelium, it will also be having goblet cells, and I'll show you a better one that will be having the goblet cells nicely. When we talk of the respiratory mucosa, we are referring to that epithelial lining which is to the surface columnar ciliated epithelium. And we're also referring to its lamina propria. The lamina propria is this loose connective tissue just beneath the epithelium. So that is respiratory mucosa. It is referring to the epithelial lining and its lamina propria. And lamina propria is the connective tissue beneath all right, so we can see that epithelium again, confirming that uh, it is pseudostratified. As you can see, we have short cells and tall cells. Only the tall ones can reach the top and they're ciliated. Lamina propria is the connective tissue just beneath. This is how respiratory epithelium looks like. And uh, in this one, we can also see goblet cells. So we can now give it its full name. Pseudosatified columnar ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. Remember, goblet cells are mucus cells. And how do you know they're mucus cells? Usually, the mucus doesn't stain using the normal, the, the conventional dyes that we use. The conventional dyes that we use are, uh, are uh, hydrophilic dyes, the soluble in water. So they don't dissolve mucus, basically. And so that's why the mucus remain unstained. That is respiratory epithelium that is present in the respiratory region of the nasal cavity. But let me say this. The respiratory epithelium actually lines most of the airways 
And so you need to understand more about respiratory epithelium because I'm not going to repeat it so much. It's not limited to the nasal cavity. You're also going to find it in the most of the airways, you're going to find respiratory epithelium. So having said that, let's deal with this respiratory epithelium into completion. What are the cell types which are present in the respiratory epithelium? The majority of the cells are the ciliated columnar cells those long cells which have cilia. The role of the cells is basically to form the protective lining, the protective barrier of the mucosa. But the cilia they contain help to propel particles to a particular direction. Usually the ones in the lower tree will propel particles upwards and the ones in the upper tree will be pro propelling the the particles posteriorly or inferiorly, depending on the orientation there. Now, the understanding is this, that they, whatever they're propelling is actually mucus, mucus that is on the surface, mucus that has been produced by the second cell type, the goblet cells. So the mucus that the goblet cells produce trap particles, but if it's not propelled, it will be static. And so the cilia propel the mucus to a particular direction so that now whatever the mucus has trapped will be again propelled in that manner. We call that one the mucociliary rejection current. So we have a mucociliary rejection current in the respiratory tree, which is responsible for propelling particles to a particular direction. The direction is the direction of the pharynx, the direction of the throat, so the ones in the nasal cavity go backwards. Don't be tempted to say that they propel substances outwards. Otherwise, all of you will be having handkerchiefs all over every time. So the ones in the nasal cavity go backwards and the ones in the lower tree go upwards. The junction is the pharynx, the throat. Then from there, it depends on your habit. So we all swallow, some people spit. The third cell type are the basal cells. These are the short cells, those very short cells on the base. And basically they function as stem cells, giving rise to the other cell types. We have what you call the small granule cells, otherwise known as the cool cheesecake cells, known to be able to produce some hormonal factors in response to nerve stimulation. They're part of the neuroendocrine system. The brass cells usually have a lot of sensory nerve terminals, at their base, and so they are also responsible for general sensations, basically, in the airway. Okay, so those are the cell types which are in the respiratory epithelium at the level of the nose. However, if you are talking about respiratory epithelium at the level of the bronchioles, we will add another cell type here, which we call the Clara cell. Clara cell is only found at the level of the bronchioles, and it produces something similar to surfactant and has similar functions. So remember, the cell types of the respiratory epithelium apply to all parts of the respiratory tree, but for the bronchioles, we add another cell type here, the clara cells. Great, those are the cell types of the respiratory epithelium. So let's talk about the third region, histological region of the nasal cavity, and that's the olfactory region. The olfactory region of the nasal cavity refers to the upper one third of the nasal cavity. That region is lined by olfactory mucosa as opposed to respiratory mucosa. When you talk of olfactory mucosa, we're referring to this epithelium and its basal lamina. The epithelium being pseudostatified columnar ciliated epithelium, but without the goblet cells, as you can see here. So it is to the certified columna, you can see that there's a zone that is relatively devoid of the nuclei, and you can see that there's a cilia 
ciliated lining there. And then this is pseudo certification. So pseudo certified columnar ciliated epithelium without goblet cells. That is what is in the epithelial lining. Then the lamina propria of uh, olfactory mucosa is also characteristic because it contains nerve bundles and it also contains several glands. We don't see that one in the respiratory epithelium. The nerve bundles are not that much in the respiratory epithelium. Well, the glands are there, but we don't call them Bowman's glands. However, we don't have the nerve bundles in the re respiratory mucosa. So that is how we can identify this is still olfactory epithelium, pseudostatified columnar ciliated epithelium without goblet cells. This is a nerve bundle, this, this, this big thing you're seeing extending that way, that's a nerve bundle. What are the cell types of the olfactory epithelium? We have the olfactory receptor cells. The olfactory receptor cells are basically bipolar neurons and they're the first order neurons in the pathway of smell. These cells are usually the ones with the cilia, so they're the ones which are ciliated. We have the sustentacular cells. The sustentacular cells are the supporting cells. So they provide both structural support as well as metabolic support to the olfactory receptor cells. Then we do have the basal cells. The basal cells, just like in the respiratory epithelium, are responsible for regeneration. And lastly, we also have the brush cells, which are for general sensation, just like what we saw in the respiratory epithelium. Now, maybe let me say that the brush cells are not that much in the olfactory epithelium, but yes, there are a few scattered ones. Remember, not for olfactory sensation, but general sensation. Okay. So having talked about the olfactory epithelium and the respiratory epithelium, or let me put it this way, having talked about olfactory mucosa and respiratory mucosa, are you able to then talk about the differences between the two? And I want to give you a minute to just reflect on that one. The differences between olfactory mucosa and the respiratory mucosa. We're looking at the histological differences. So from gross perspective, remember the location. Uh, olfactory mucosa is on the upper part of the nasal cavity. So usually occupying three regions from a gross anatomy perspective, the superior turbinate, the roof of the nose, and the upper part of the nasal septum. That is where you have the olfactory mucosa. Three strikers, the superior turbinate, the roof, as well as the upper part of the nasal septum. Then the rest will be occupied by respiratory mucosa. You have one minute to talk about the differences between the two. Okay, one minute is over. We can now proceed. Let's talk about the paranasal sinuses. We are aware that paranasal sinuses are air-filled cavities within the bones that surround the nose. So we name them according to the bone that is housing the sinus. For example, we have the maxillary air sinus within the maxillary bone. We have the ethmoidal air sinuses within the ethmoid bone. We have the frontal air sinus within the frontal bone and we have the sphenoid air sinus within the sphenoid bone. There are four paranasal air sinuses. 
from gross anatomy perspective, I believe you know the functions of the paranasal sinuses, that the actual function may not be very clear, but we know that at least they help to reduce the weight of the skull. We also are aware that uh, perhaps they contribute to resonance in your voice when you speak. From histological perspective, they're just air cavities. And so the bone there is also lined by epithelium, by let's say mucosa. And that mucosa is the respiratory mucosa. So they're just extensions of the respiratory region of the nasal cavity. The paranasal sinuses are lined by respiratory mucosa. The only exception is that the respiratory mucosa within the paranasal sinuses tend to have more goblet cells than the respiratory mucosa within the nasal airway themselves. Perhaps that's the only exception. But they're all respiratory mucosa as an extension. Remember beneath that respiratory mucosa, we have bone and you know the histology of bone, so we don't have to talk about that one. And remember when we talk of mucosa, we're referring to epithelium and it's basal lamina, sorry, and it's lamina propria. So that is uh, one of the, a slide taken from one of the paranasal sinuses. And what you see is the respiratory epithelium there with a lamina propria and deep to that we see bone, yeah, well thin, but it's still bone. And then we see something similar to bone marrow on the other side. You can forget about that one. The aim is for you to see that. From the nasal cavity, we go to the pharynx. Remember the pharynx is a common passage for both food and air. And the pharynx has three regions. This is the nasal pharynx, and that's the oral pharynx, and this is the laryngopharynx named according to the anatomical space that is anterior. Nasopharynx is behind the nose, oropharynx behind the mouth, and laryngopharynx behind the larynx. The epithelium of the pharynx therefore reflects both functions, both digestive function for passage of food with a lot of friction and uh, passage of air. So there'll be some regions that contain the respiratory mucosa, and that those regions that will contain extension of the mucosa of the oral cavity. So like in this region, the nasal pharynx, we'll expect that region to be lined by respiratory mucosa. The oral pharynx and the laryngopharynx are predominantly lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium, just to be able to withstand friction. Importantly to note is that uh, the pharynx has some layers and that is largely from gross anatomy perspective. Remember the five pharyngeal layers or other five layers of the pharyngeal wall. I believe you remember them. Remember the muscular layer of the pharynx is largely skeletal muscle as opposed to smooth muscles. And also remember that uh, the muscular layer of the pharyngeal wall is predominantly inner longitudinal and outer circular, although the upper parts may have a difference, but predominantly inner longitudinal and outer circular. We will look at the uniqueness of the pharyngeal wall, largely when you look at the histology of the digestive system. And you'll be comparing the layers of the esophagus with the layers of the pharynx. But there's something I want to state that the mucosa of the pharynx houses some tonsillar tissue. It houses tonsillar tissues. And I want us to look at histology of one tonsillar tissue. This is basically the palatine tonsil. So tonsillar tissue look like this. 
from a low magnification, you are not able to pick much apart from various follicular aggregations. As you can see, they are all over in this particular tissue and also some extensions into what we call the crypt. A high magnification displays that uh, the tonsillar tissue is lined by stratified squamous non-keratinous epithelium, as you can see on top there, with some connective tissue beneath that lamina propria. But beneath that one, we have some aggregations of uh, lymphoid tissue. I know maybe you're not familiar with how lymphoid tissue looks like yet. Usually lymphoid tissue is highly cellular, as we can see in this particular, very tiny cells grouped together, highly cellular. That cellularity would fix them. Then you can see, you can see aggregations like that, 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 and that. Those are the ones we call the aggregations or the follicles, basically. So we're seeing different follicles within this big mass. And in some regions, we see an extension into the tissue. And that's what we call the crypt, tonsillar crypt. So the presence of the tonsillar crypt is also important from histological perspective in helping you identify the tonsillar tissue, as well as from a functional perspective in helping to move perhaps infectious material to this region so that they can get in touch with the follicular aggregations. So just picked one tonsillar tissue to show you how some regions of the pharyngeal wall may have tonsillar tissues, but uh, you'll have a separate lecture on histologic organization of the lymphatic tissues. From the pharynx, we go to the larynx. And basically, you remember the parts of the larynx from gross anatomy, there are two folds which divide the larynx into three regions. They have the laryngeal vestibule, the laryngeal ventricle, and the infraglottic space. Remember this vestibular fold? It's also called the false vocal cord, and the vocal fold is also known as the true vocal cord. From histological perspective, we are seeing that the vocal cord, that's the vestibular fold. And so this is the laryngeal ventricle. The wall of the larynx consists of a skeleton, as well as the respiratory mucosa predominantly, or let me say the mucosa. Now we have the mucosa, we also have the skeletal framework, and we have muscles all within the wall of the larynx. If you are to focus on this laryngeal skeleton, the laryngeal skeleton is made up of cartilages and membranes. So remember the different types of cartilages. From gross anatomy perspective, there are many cartilages. From histological perspective, there are predominantly two types. There are those ones which are elastic cartilages, and that include the epiglottic cartilage and the small laryngeal cartilages. Those ones are elastic cartilages. And then the rest are hyaline cartilages. So the other large laryngeal cartilages like uh, thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage are basically hyaline type of cartilage. The arytenoid cartilage is a mixture. The apices of arytenoid cartilage are elastic. The bases of arytenoid cartilages are uh, hyaline cartilages. The membranes you're talking about are basically connective tissue membranes. So they are fibrous connective tissue membranes from a histological perspective. The musculature of the larynx is also divided into intrinsic and extrinsic laryngeal musculature. But all the musculature are skeletal muscles. So they are skeletal muscles, they are voluntary muscles. The intrinsic muscles of the larynx are the ones which control 
the size of the laryngeal inlet. They also control the tension of the vocal cord or they control the size of the glottis. So remember those three, the laryngeal inlet, the glottis, and the tension of the vocal cord. That is what the intrinsic laryngeal musculatures do. They are basically limited to the larynx. The extrinsic laryngeal musculature attach the larynx to other regions, and they are responsible for either elevating or depressing the larynx. The ones that elevate the larynx are generally called the suprahyoid muscles, and the ones that depress the larynx are generally called the infrahyoid muscles. In terms of the mucosal line, we have both stratified squamous, non-cratinous epithelium, as well as pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium within the larynx. Now, the stratified squamous non-cratinous epithelium is largely on the vocal cords as well as on the epiglottis. So that would be stratified squamous non-keratinous. Well, occasionally we may have some degree of keratinization on the vocal cords, but predominantly non-keratinized. And then the pseudostratified columnar epithelium is the one that lines the rest of the laryngeal spaces. Remember this pseudostratified columnar epithelium is basically the respiratory epithelium that we've been talking about. So that is with regard to laryngeal histology. Take note of the differences in the epithelial lining of the false and the true vocal cord. From the larynx, we go to the trachea. So the trachea extends from the cricoid cartilage to the level of the carina. So this is the carina and that is the cricoid cartilage. So that, there's some part of the trachea that is in the neck. There's a part of the trachea that is in the thorax. From histological perspective, this is how the trachea looks like. You see something with a C-shaped structure within its wall, that's cartilage, and posteriorly it's defective. In most cases, the trachea will be given to you with esophagus. And if that is so, then the esophagus will be somewhere here behind. That's a lymph node, so you can ignore about it. But remember, we have lymph nodes, which are paratracheal. Would expect the epithelium of the larynx to be on this, of the trachea to be on this side, the inner side. So this is the laryngeal space, the tracheal space. The wall of the trachea can be described to have four histological layers. The innermost layer is known as the mucosa. And the mucosa of the larynx of the, I don't know, I keep on saying larynx, the mucosa of the trachea consists of the respiratory epithelium that we talked about. Remember, it is pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. It also has the lamina propria. The lamina propria of the mucosa of the trachea is very rich in elastic fibers to allow for extension, to allow for extension and then going back to normal. But it's also rich in aggregation of lymphoid tissue. The aggregations of lymphoid tissue, which are found within the mucosa of different uh, visceral structures are generally called <clears throat> malt. When you talk of malt, we are referring to mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, malt, M A L T, malt, mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. So we usually have a lot of malt in visceral organs. We find them in the respiratory tree, in the digestive tree, 
in the reproductive tract and the like. The mucosa contain a lot of aggregation of lymphoid tissue, malt. Now, specifically, the malt that is found within the respiratory tree can be called bronchus associated lymphatic tissue, BALT. So the B there stands for bronchus. And this is now specific to the respiratory tree. If this was a gastrointestinal tract, then we can call it GALT for gut associated lymphatic tissue. The concept here is that they're all mucosa associated lymphatic tissues. And when we are going to learn on histology of the lymphatic tissue, we are going to find out that there are two structural entities that constitute a malt. This is what we call diffuse lymphatic tissue. And this is what we call lymphatic nodules. So you can have diffuse lymphatic tissue, which you can't even see the boundary. It's just aggregation of cells, but you can't see their boundaries. It's diffuse. Then you can have lymphatic nodules. Even though they don't have a capsule, you can see their definite boundaries. So whether it is diffuse lymphatic tissue or lymphatic nodules, which some people call lymphatic follicles, they are present within the lamina propria of the trachea. And not limited to the trachea as well, we also find the bulk in the rest of the respiratory tree. So that is layer one, the mucosal layer. Layer two is called the submucosa. The submucosa of the trachea consists of loose connective tissue, which contain seromucous glands. Those are exocrine glands. And then the third histological layer of the trachea is what I prefer calling musculocartilaginous layer. Some books may give them different names, but I prefer calling them musculocartilaginous layer so that I capture everything I want to talk about. The musculocartilaginous layer of the trachea consists of the C-shaped cartilage ring bridged posteriorly by smooth muscle called trachealis. So in this image, this is the C-shaped cartilage ring. And uh, on this region, we expect smooth muscle to run from that edge to that edge, transversely like this. So the muscle are not running longitudinally. They run transversely so that they bridge the gap of the C. Well, if this section was taken at a region where there's no cartilage, then it'd just be muscle. And this region, we have cartilage and muscle. So that's the musculocartilaginous layer. Remember the type of cartilage that is in the airways is basically hyaline type of cartilage. Again, you know how hyaline cartilage looks like. Outermost layer of the trachea is called the adventitia. The adventitia of the trachea is a, a thin connective tissue that binds the trachea to the adjacent structures. So usually to touch it to the esophagus posteriorly or to lymph nodes uh, on either side. Basically, this is what attaches the trachea to other structure. Of course, not at the rent per se, but just attach it. So those are the histological layers of the tracheal wall. Maybe a higher magnification of that will reveal this for you. So this is the respiratory epithelium. You can see it there, pseudostratified columna, ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. Deep to that, we have the lamina propria. So these two constitute the mucosa. Remember the lamina propria has a lot of elastic fibers, not shown in this image because you've not stained specifically for elastic fibers. Then from there, all the way to here is what we're calling the submucosa. It's a loose connective tissue 
but it contains several glandular structures as we can see here. Of course, you also see blood vessels. The glands here are seromucous glands. Deep to that is this region where we're seeing cartilage and uh, the cartilage you're seeing there is hyaline cartilage. So this is the musculocartilaginous layer. At this level, we are seeing the cartilage part. Then beyond that, we expect adventitia. Well, not so definite on this particular image, but here yeah, that region would be the adventitia. So these are the histological layers of the tracheal wall. Now, I want you to look at this image. You'll be seeing this a lot when you come when you look at the slide the track here. You can see this one is a luminal structure with some longitudinal folds which have been cut in cross section. The lining of this lumen is basically stratified squamous non keratinous epithelium. Usually, this is how the esophagus looks like. And you'll be seeing this a lot adjacent to the trachea. In the slides that you take, you usually take trachea and esophagus. So don't look at the slide of trachea and esophagus and focus on the esophagus side and the thing you are describing the trachea. That's my point. Remember, for esophagus to be lined by stratified squamous non keratinous epithelium, we'll have a lecture on histological organization of the hologite. So this is how the tracheal would look like. And this is the region for the gap. We'd expect this esophageal structure to be somewhere here. It has been displaced, but uh, not a big deal. After the trachea, we talk about the bronchi. From histological perspective, Okay, let me start from gross anatomy perspective. From gross anatomy perspective, we have three levels of bronchi. The primary bronchus, which is also called the principal bronchus. That is the first generation of airway division. What I mean by that is that, you know, when air moves all the way from the nasal cavity to the pharynx, to the larynx, to the trachea, we see that that is just following one path so far, no diversion. But when you reach the bronchi, a decision has to be made. Some air must take the right route and some air must take the left route. There is division. The principal bronchus is the first generation of air with division. So so-called the primary bronchus. The first generation of airway division goes to each lung. And then we have the secondary bronchus, which is also called the lobar bronchus. The lobar bronchus is the second generation of airway division. And that one goes to each lobe of the lung. Generally put, the right lung has three of them, and the left one has two of them. Now in terms of naming, on, on the right side, let's just get something correct here. On the right side, usually the bronchus, the secondary bronchus that goes to the upper lobe is given first. And so the, it is the common stem before the other two are given. It doesn't, trifurcate, that's my point, that even though the right principal bronchus has three lobar bronchus, it is not a trifurcation. The one that's going to the upper lobe is given first, then there is a segment, a common segment that will give you the other two. That common segment is called the bronchus intermediates. Okay, so we have the bronchus Intermediates there, we have the right upper lobe bronchus there. Then we have the middle lobe bronchus and we have the lower lobe bronchus. 
the right lower lobe bronchus there. Anyway, the lower bronchi are the second generation of airway division, if you forget about the concept of the bronchus intermediates. Then we have the third generation of airway division, which we call the tertiary bronchus. The tertiary bronchus is also known as the segmental bronchus. Those ones go to each bronchopulmonary segment of a lung. So that is uh, from gross anatomy, the bronchi, three generations. From histological perspective, we look at them as either being inside the lung or outside the lung. And therefore that largely applies to the principal bronchus because the principal bronchus is the one that has parts intra and parts extra pulmonary. The secondary and the tertiary bronchus are all intrapulmonary bronchi. Now from histological perspective, the extra pulmonary bronchus has a similar structure to the trachea, except that the cartilages are now complete rings as opposed to C-shaped cartilage rings. In the other hand, the intrapulmonary bronchi are unique this way. Instead of the cartilage rings, they have cartilage plates. They are irregular cartilage plates instead of cartilage rings. They also have circular layer of smooth muscles and definitely we'll expect them to have narrower lumen. So remember, I'm just giving you what is different from the template I've given you about the track here. Instead of the cartilage rings, we have cartilage plates. Then there's a layer of smooth muscles that is circular. Remember in the track here, it was just bridging the sea. Now here we have circular. And uh, of course we'll expect the lumen to be slightly narrower than what we have, but that is gross largely. Now, when you describe the histology of the bronchi, we describe it as having five histological layers instead of four because of the presence of the smooth muscle layer that I've talked about. Now, these are the layers of the bronchial wall. The first layer is the mucosa which is made up of pseudosulfide columna ciliated epithelium with goblet cells and its lamina propria. Layer two is the muscularis layer. The muscularis layer consists of a layer of, a thin layer of smooth muscles going round all over. And that's what you see there. Layer three, the submucosa which is made up of loose connective tissue with seromucous glands. In this case, we call them bronchial glands. Layer four, the cartilage layer. The cartilage layer is basically hyaline cartilage plates, plates of hyaline cartilage predominantly. And then layer five, is that ventitial layer, this one here, which is a thin connective tissue joining it with the surrounding structures. So remember there's a remarkable difference between the tracheal histology and the histology of the interpulmonary bronchus, especially on that layer too. The trachea doesn't have that muscularis layer deep to the mucosa, but the bronchi has it very prominent as you can see there. So the slides I'm showing you here are slides of bronchi. You can see in this one, this is a lumen. So this is respiratory epithelium. Well, we've compromised on magnification so that we can see a large structure. And so you'll maybe just believe me to say that that is respiratory epithelium. Of course, using a lumen is not questionable. 
deep to that mucosa, you can see a thin layer of smooth muscle, that one and that one. That's the muscularis layer. You can also see beyond that one, this plate of cartilage and that plate of cartilage and that plate of cartilage, that plate of cartilage, even that one. And see outside, we can see some alveolar structures. We'll be talking about them shortly. But the fact that you can see alveolar structure means that you're already intrapulmonary. And the fact that you can see cartilages means that you are looking at a bronchus. So this is the structure of an intrapulmonary bronchus, similar to even the next one there, intrapulmonary bronchus. That's a cartilage plate. And uh, this is the lumen. Perhaps this is a smaller version than that. So maybe one was taken at the level of the lower bronchus and another one at the level of the tertiary bronchus. But basically, you'll still expect to have the smooth muscle layer beneath the mucosa and you'll have the cartilage plates. Remember, the cartilages are not complete rings. You occasionally see blood vessels next to them. They usually run together like that one. And I was forgetting that a lymphoid aggregation, that could be another lymphoid aggregation. Perhaps this is more diffuse because we can't see the boundaries. This ones appear relatively discreet. So I would go with this one being somewhat a lymphoid follicle. And these are diffuse lymphatic tissue. All of them constitute mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, malt. The malt is present predominantly in the lamina propria, but it can also be present any part of the wall of the bronchial tree, as you can see in that one. Beyond the bronchi, we talk about bronchioles. Bronchioles are narrow lumen, less than one millimeter in diameter. And there are three types of bronchioles from gross anatomy perspective the conducting bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles, and the respiratory bronchioles. Now, let's look at it from a generational perspective. First generation of airway division, principal bronchus. Second generation of airway division, lobar bronchus to each lobe. Third generation of airway division, tertiary bronchus or segmental bronchus to each bronchopulmonary segment of a lung. From fourth generation onwards, we talk about bronchioles. And there are several generations of divisions of bronchioles. From the fourth generation, to the 19th generation of airway division, we are talking about bronchioles. Very many generations of airway division. Unfortunately, they are all named. Good news that we can classify them into just those three. This way, from the fourth generation to the 15th generation is what we call the conducting bronchioles. The 16th generation is what we call the terminal bronchial. And that one marks the end of the conducting zone of the respiratory tree, the terminal bronchial. From the 17th generation to the 19th generation, we call them respiratory bronchioles because they contain alveoli on their wall so they're able to participate in gas exchange. They are therefore not part of the conducting zone, but they are part of the respiratory zone. From embryology perspective, we are going to talk about them as being the intermediate zones. But from histology perspective and physiology perspective, they are part of the respiratory zone respiratory bronchioles, so they're not part of conducting zone. Well, I hope you've understood what bronchioles are. Now, histologically, what do we see? 
the walls of the bronchioles do not have the cartilages. Neither do they have the glands. Point to note. The walls of bronchioles have a thick muscular layer, thicker than what you've seen in the bronchi. The larger bronchioles will be lined by pseudosulfur columnar ciliated epithelium, the larger ones. So maybe generation four, five, six there. Uh, there's no sharp cutoff. So just understand the larger bronchioles will be lined by pseudosulfur columnar ciliated epithelium. However, the smaller bronchioles are lined by simple cuboidal epithelium. These smaller bronchioles also have very few ciliated cells. You know, those columnar cells, which are characteristic of the respiratory tree, they'll be few in the smaller bronchioles. But important, the smaller bronchioles have more clara cells. I told you that the bronchioles are unique by the presence of the clara cells. So this is what is unique about histology of the bronchus. So this is, sorry, histology of the bronchial. And this is a bronchial with all confidence because we cannot see any cartilage plate. Yes, you can confirm that we are inside the lung, you can see the alveolar structures, but we cannot see any cartilage. So that's a bronchial. And that's how we expect you to identify a bronchial, the absence of cartilage. It's an airway structure inside the lung, but doesn't have cartilage. That's a bronchial. Don't think about it too much. We don't expect you to be able to distinguish between the conducting bronchial and the terminal bronchial, but I'll show you how you distinguish the respiratory bronchial from the other bronchioles. Now look at this, these are still bronchial. We can see an airway, it's inside the lung, and you can see a thick smooth muscle layer, no cartilage. Even this one, thick smooth muscle layer, no cartilage. Remember the epithelium is not necessarily pseudostratified columnar ciliated. It will depend on the size of the bronchial. It can actually just be simple cuboidal. Now compare this to your left. There's an airway there. We can see cartilage plates. So with all confidence, this is a bronchus. In as much as we can say whether it is secondary or tertiary bronchus, but a bronchus. We can see we are inside the lung, so it is interpulmonary. On this end, this one here is a bronchial. That bronchial has a solid wall, as you can see. There are no cartilage. So these are bronchial. This is still a bronchial, this one. But what's the difference between this one and that one? This one has its wall interrupted by alveoli. As you can see, that, that interruption, that interruption, that interruption. Yes, you can still see some wall, thick, but interrupted by alveoli. So this one here is what we call the respiratory bronchial, generation 17 to 19, respiratory bronchial. That makes this one be a terminal bronchial. The moment you've seen that's giving you respiratory bronchial, this one will be definitely a terminal bronchial. Now let's follow again the respiratory bronchial or even that one. You may reach a place where now you don't even see a wall like that region. You don't see a wall or let me follow this one is better. You don't see a wall per se. There's a part as you can see there, but there's no wall. It's just full of alveoli. 
So that one, we are no longer in the conducting zone, definitely the conducting zone ends there. This is respiratory bronchial. This one here is called alveolar duct. We are coming to it when you look at the respiratory zone, but these are alveolar ducts. So I want you to be able to pick the difference between a terminal bronchial and a respiratory bronchial. That's the aim of that slide. A respiratory bronchial will have a wall fine. You can see some thickness, but it is interrupted by alveoli pockets. Okay, now we are done with the, the first two agenda, which was largely the last larger part of the talk. Now let's talk about the proximal distal structural changes in the airway. So what are the changes which occur in the airway as you move from proximal to distal? One, we've noted that the bone is actually disappearing. You know, nasal cavity had bone on its wall, but that's the last time we talked about bone. This continuous branching, we've appreciated that from the bronchi downwards. We've also appreciated the change in the structure of cartilage in terms of uh, in the trachea, it is C-shaped. In the extrapulmonary bronchus, it is a complete ring. And in the interpulmonary bronchus, there are cut plates of cartilage. We've also appreciated the disappearance of cartilage. So from the bronchi going to bronchioles, we don't have cartilages. We can appreciate the concept of narrowing of the lumen as you go down. The thickness of the wall is also reducing as you go down. And I think that should make sense to you that the trachea has a thicker wall compared to a bronchial. We've noted that the epithelium becomes simple as you go down. Look at it this way. The nasal vestibule had stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium. Then the rest had strat, sorry, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. We went with that all the way to the trachea, bronchi. In the bronchioles, we then talked about simple cuboidal epithelium. So the epithelium becomes simple, one layer of cells, basically from a pseudo stratification to a simplification. The amount of smooth muscles seem to increase as you go down. The tracker didn't have so much of smooth muscle. The bronchi had uh, more smooth muscle than tracker. Definitely the bronchioles have the largest bulk of smooth muscles within their wall. Appearance of clara cells, and this is specific for the region of the bronchioles, that the region of the bronchioles have clara cells within the wall. I've told you the function of the clara cell, they produce something similar to surfactant. Well, it'll be called lipoprotein 16, which help to, again, maintain the patency of the alveoli. It reduces the surface tension of the alveoli, so preventing alveolar collapse. There is significant reduction in the number of goblet cells, so that we don't see goblet cells in the bronchioles, really. Very few, if any, we don't see them. But there are a lot in the nose, in the trachea, paranasal sinuses, there are a lot, but there's reduction. And lastly, there is a reduction in the amount of cilia as you go down so that the bronchioles don't have a lot of cilia in as much as you had a significant amount of them within the trachea and the nasal cavity. So these are the proximal distal changes which occur in the airway as you move from proximal to distal segments.
let's look at the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone of the lung refer to regions of the lung where gas exchange take place. These regions are therefore also known as the functional unit of the lung. There are some characteristics that are unique to the functional unit of the lung. There are some characteristics which are unique to the respiratory zone. So what are the features of the respiratory zone? One, the respiratory zone contain alveolar units. It has alveoli, that's a point. So any part of the respiratory tree that has alveoli can participate in gas exchange. So it's a respiratory zone. The tissue interface between air and blood is also very thin in the respiratory zone. Said in a different way, the distance that has to be covered by molecules of gases from the airways into the bloodstream, the tissue barrier is very thin. You can call that one the respiratory membrane. So it has very thin respiratory membranes. And three, these regions, which you are calling the respiratory zone, is richly vascularized. Several capillaries go into these regions. Everywhere there are capillaries. These are the characteristics of the respiratory zone. Very unique to them. We don't see these ones in the conducting zone. So what are the components of the respiratory zone? I prefer using a diagram to draw rather than just listing them. So let's consider the black one to be the terminal bronchial generation 16 of airway division. From generation 17 to 19, we have something that looks like that. Now look at that kind of an airway. Yet it is an airway, it's an air passage, but the wall is interrupted by alveoli. That means that they're able to participate in gas exchange. These are the ones we've called the respiratory bronchioles, extending from 17th to 19th generation of airway division. The respiratory bronchioles then divide into structures which look like this. Again, there are channels as we can see. What is unique about them is that there's no discernible wall because the wall is just full of alveoli. Unlike this one, yes, there's alveolar pocket, but there's a discernible wall. The wall is just interrupted. In this other one, there's no discernible wall. It's just full of alveoli. This is what we call the alveolar ducts. Alveolar ducts then end in structures which balloon out like that, which we call alveolar sacs. Multiple alveolar sacs meet at this particular region, which we call the alveolar antrum. The plural is antra. Okay, so these four are the components of the respiratory zone. Respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and alveolar antra. The alveolar antra are regions where two or more alveolar sacs meet. Remember, they are characterized by presence of alveoli, thin blood air tissue interface and rich vascularization. So from histology perspective, this is what you could see regarding the components of the respiratory zone. If that's a terminal bronchial, as I'd already guided you earlier, 
This is a respiratory bronchiole. That's an alveolar duct. You can't see a discernible wall. That's how an alveolar sac would look like. And of course, these single ones are the alveoli. Even that is an alveolus, even that is an alveolus. So that's how you distinguish them from histology slide of a lab. Now we can talk about the cell types in the alveoli. The alveolus is the unit of uh, gas exchange, basically. So there are several pockets, tiny pockets. The alveolar have three principal cell types. We call them pneumocyte type one, pneumocyte type two, and pneumocyte type three. Let's start with the pneumocyte type one. The pneumocyte type one is a squamous cell, as you can see here. It's a flat cell. This flat cell is very thin, as you can see. Even though they are few, they occupy the largest surface area of the lung because of their shape. They occupy a larger surface area. So they could be very few, fewer than the type two cells significantly few, but they occupy over 90% of the surface area because of their shape. The squamous alveolar cell is the one that establishes the tissue barrier between air in the alveolus and the red blood cell within the capillaries. So it's the one that establishes the respiratory membrane. It is through pneumocyte type one that gas exchange take place through diffusion. So oxygen diffuses through pneumocyte type one that way and carbon dioxide that way. We can therefore say that pneumocyte type one is for gas exchange. How about pneumocyte type two? The pneumocyte type two is this one. As you can see, it's a cuboidal cell. So there are in number, there are more than the type one cells. But in terms of surface area, because they're cuboidal, they occupy very small surface area. This one produces surfactant. I've told you the role of surfactant is to reduce the surface tension of the alveoli to prevent alveolar collapse. Said in a different way, the role of the surfactant is to promote pulmonary compliance, the expansion capacity of the alveoli. You'll be taught more about surfactant in respiratory physiology. Anyway, I want you to now have an understanding. There are some cells which produce similar substance within the bronchioles. We've called them clara cells. Then there are these cells, which are calling pneumocyte type 2. They also produce that substance within the alveolus. And so these two cells are very important in maintaining the patency of the alveoli, therefore the compliance of the lungs. In terms of whether they produce the same chemical substance, the answer is no. But these chemical substances have a symbiotic function in terms of how they contribute to the expansion of the alveoli. Now, the other role of pneumocyte type two is to give rise to pneumocyte type one. The concept here is that the pneumocyte type one is a cell that's at its G0 phase of the cell cycle. They don't divide. Once you destroy a pneumocyte type one, it's the end of it. Then the G0 phase of the cell cycle. But the pneumocyte type one are actively mitotic. So they can give rise to pneumocyte type 1. Usually what happens is that once a pneumocyte type 1 goes away, 
for whatever reason. The pneumocyte type two will lose the capacity for production of surfactant. It will flatten out and spread out to become pneumocyte type one. The third alveolar cell type, are the pneumocyte type three, which we also call the dust cells. This is the dust cell. You can call it pulmonary alveolar macrophages. As the name suggests, they are macrophages. So remember what macrophages do, they clear debris, and basically they are important for immune functions. So the ones that help in immunity in the lungs. Great, so those are the alveolar cell types. While we are there, we can then describe the components of the respiratory membrane. We'll talk about the thin and the thick blood air barrier. Look at this image here. That's an alveolus. We've described the different cell types. This is a blood vessel. It's a capillary with a red blood cell inside. So we want oxygen molecule to move from here into here. Or you want carbon dioxide to move from there to there. What are the structures that those gases must traverse from one side to another? That is what we are calling the respiratory membrane or the blood air barrier. I prefer doing it this way using just an image so that we understand some things. Consider this to be the alveolus lined by squamous epithelium, which we've called pneumocyte one. Remember, on the other side, we have blood vessels, so capillaries. And capillaries contain blood, they're lined by endothelial cells, which are also squamous cells. So this is capillary endothelium. The endothelial cells and the pneumocyte type one are all epithelial cells. So they all have basement membrane. That green one is the basement membrane of the pneumocyte type one. And uh, that other green one is the basement membrane of the capillary endothelium. So basal lamina of the two epithelial cells. Now we note therefore that there are some regions where the basal lamina are actually fused and there's some regions where the basal lamina are not fused. Have that in mind. We've noted also that in the alveoli, we have pneumocyte type two that produce surfactant. And so that surfactant will be covering the surface of the alveoli like that. The blue is the surfactant layer. Now we are ready to describe the blood air barrier. You want oxygen to move from there to there. So let's just list the structures that that oxygen molecule will pass through. So first, it will have to go through the surfactant layer, as you can see. And then it will go through the pneumocyte type one, which is the alveolar epithelium the epithelium of the alveoli, pneumocyte type one. After that, the oxygen molecule will have to go through this basal lamina that is fused. The basal lamina of pneumocyte type one and the basal lamina of the capillary endothelium are fused. It will have to go through that fused basal lamina. And lastly, it will have to go through the capillary endothelium. That is what we call the thin blood air barrier with those four structural entities. If you read some physiology books, they may add another fifth one here in the understanding that the air molecule here, oxygen molecule, will have to move all the way into a red blood cell. So they usually add the cell membrane of the red blood cell as part of the barrier. I've considered not to add that one here 
because I'm just looking at air blood barrier. And for me, blood does not mean that you must be inside the red blood cell. As long as you're in the bloodstream, I've already described the barrier. That's the thin blood air barrier. How about the thick blood air barrier? Let's use another image to describe the thick blood air barrier. We've already discovered the thin one there. Remember, there are some regions where the basal lamina are not fused. So in those regions, what do you have? Shaded in black, those regions have interstitial tissue. So with that in mind, if air was to move, and I'm not saying air usually moves, but if it was to move, what will it go through? We'll talk about the surfactant again, then the alveolar epithelium, then the basement membrane of the alveolar epithelium. Then we have to talk about the interstitial tissue then. Then back to the basement membrane of the capillary endothelium, and lastly, the capillary endothelium itself. Again, that concept of the cell membrane of the red blood cell, you can add it there to make them seven. You can choose to leave it to make them six. This is the thick blood air barrier. So what is the role of the thick and the thin blood air barrier? The thin blood air barrier is for gas exchange. The thick blood air barrier is not primarily for gas exchange, but there are potential spaces for accumulation of fluid in cases of pulmonary edema. When you have fluid accumulation in the lung, fluid will rather accumulate in the thick blood air barriers so that we protect the thin air barriers for gas exchange. So it's a protective mechanism for the lungs to protect against uh, some degree of fluid overload in the lungs, which can happen well, if it is, goes beyond extreme, then definitely the respiratory member is going to be compromised because as you can see, as fluid begin to accumulate there, it will be expanding this one slowly. And so it will compromise even the thin barrier. But if it's some just little fluid, that fluid will be accumulating the thick barrier within the interstitial tissue so that you don't affect gas exchange. If it's a lot, then it will have to compromise. And then that's when you hear somebody's now having pulmonary edema, and it's actually a medical emergency. It can lead to death anytime. Great. So remember the role of the thin barrier, gas exchange, thick barrier, protective mechanism, site of accumulation of fluid. So that can protect the thin barriers for gas exchange. It can reserve the thin barriers for gas exchange. Now let's see, how do you then identify a lung on a microscope? I'm projecting this for you. I want a volunteer to just describe what you're seeing. Just a description. So you can put up your hand and then I will enable your mic to just describe what you're seeing. Then after describing, you can identify for us. Any volunteer? I'm looking for a hand. I've seen someone clapping. I'm not able to pick the clap. Okay, yes, I've seen the, the hand now. John, I'll give it to you. John, carry on. John, we can't hear you. So I'll mute you. Anybody else? 
Okay. I will continue waiting until I see a hand. This is the next slide. So here, what do we see? We see something that looks like a bad honeycomb with very thin walls and interconnected uh, spaces. The spaces are the ones we call alveoli. And the interconnection is very important. Those interconnections are very important. We don't see them in the previous slide that I showed you, but in this one, they are present. Very important. And that's what helps you to distinguish this one from the previous one. Again, one big difference between this one and the previous one is that the previous one had the cuboidal epithelium on the wall. So the epithelial lining was not very thin. But this one is very thin, squamous epithelium. So anyway, how do you know this lung? <clears throat> the presence of alveoli and that the alveoli are lined by simple squamous epithelium. The alveolar spaces are interconnected. The other thing that will help you confirm it along is if you're able to see something like that, where you're able to capture an airway, like that's a bronchial with associated blood vessels around. In some regions, you're able to capture even the bronchus with the cartilage. So the visualization of an airway structure will help you to also narrow down to it being a lung. This one to your left, you know, you can be tempted to call that adipose tissue, but it is not. Why? Look at the interconnection of the spaces. The interconnected, then look at the airways. They are present. You don't see that on adipose tissue. So that is still lung. Be keen to be checking the airways and the interconnections. To your right, is still a lung, but uh, capturing the level of the bronchus. So we're able to see cartilage plates there, also confirming the lung. So that's how you distinguish a lung slide. Let's do the last agenda, which is the defense mechanisms of the respiratory system. So basically, this is what helped the respiratory system to defend itself against infections. One is the collaboration between the ciliated epithelium and the goblet cells, basically what we call the mucociliary rejection current. The mucus trap particles and the cilia propel those particles, the, the mucus or rather, to the level of the throat, then it depends on your habit from there. Now, importantly, understand that we all swallow. And when you swallow that mucus that is containing bacteria or any other thing, is actually redirected to the stomach. Why? The stomach has contained gastric acid. So the aim is that that mucus is actually directed to the acid of the stomach, the mechanism to fight those germs. The cough reflex is an important thing. You are aware that when something irritates your airway, usually your larynx closes, you build pressure, then it opens rapidly, you cough. And uh, the pressure generated there is able to push whatever is in the airway out, the irritant. The ring of tonsillar tissue around the pharynx is also important. I showed you the tonsillar tissue histology, but remember when you talk of the Waldeas ring, we are referring to that ring of tonsillar tissue around the pharynx. So at the roof, we have the pharyngeal tonsils, 
On either side of the nasopharynx, you have the tubotone cells. And on the other side of the oropharynges, you have oropharynx, you have the palatine tone cells. And on the dorsum of the tongue, you have the lingual tone cells. Six tonsillar tissues, two paired, two not paired. That's what makes them six, but you can see there are four. That while they are ring help to fight infections. Anything entering the body usually will be most likely passing through either the nose or the mouth, if you don't think too much about that statement. Then while they are ring will be important in that regard. The mucosa associated lymphatic tissue that is present in the airway is also important. We call them bronchus associated lymphatic tissue. They help to fight infections. And lastly, we have the pulmonary alveolar macrophages present at the level of the alveoli, the dust cells also help to fight infections. These are the defense mechanisms against infections in the respiratory tree. And that marks the end of our class. Thank you very much.